my name is Bob Wilber. I'm the president of the Stowe Conservation Trust. And there are a number of uh, directors here. And before I forget, I want to make sure to thank uh, Carol Gumbart and Janet Moffat in particular uh, for helping to put on uh, this uh, event. Uh, they're both directors on the trust. Uh, the Stowe Conservation Trust is Stowe's all-volunteer land trust. Started in 1977 and has been uh, very involved in protecting hundreds and hundreds of really important acres here in, in Stowe that help preserve uh, the reasons why many of us live here. Uh, it's, it's a beautiful community. The most recent accomplishments in that regard were uh, the Carver Hill Orchard and Small Farm. And I want to thank, uh, I know many of uh, you residents uh, helped make that possible, and I want to thank you once again uh, for doing that. That was quite an accomplishment for a town of our size uh, to protect those two farms uh, at the same time. Uh, so the Stowe Conservation Trust is, as I said, an all-volunteer land trust. It's a private conservation organization, and um, all of the funds that we use, we have to raise, and so we appreciate your support on that. Uh, the annual uh, appeal is out currently, and appreciate if you can support that. Um, I also want to talk briefly before I introduce Jeff Ritterson, our uh, presenter. I want to talk a little bit about Mass Audubon. Uh, both Jeff and I work at Mass Audubon. I'm the director of land conservation there, and Jeff is a field ornithologist and coordinates uh, a program called Foresters for the Birds, and I'll talk a bit more about that in a second. Mass Audubon was started in 1896 by two women in Boston, in a brownstone in Boston. The idea was to uh, pull together a conservation organization. It was actually the first Audubon conservation organization in the world by quite a uh, distance, time-wise. Uh, it is, has remained independent to this day. Um, we have a very wonderful uh, system of wildlife sanctuaries. If you haven't gotten out to visit them, uh, I'd recommend it. Uh, some really wonderful properties. Uh, the, some of you may recognize the Audubon logo. Here it is there, the triangle. And we often talk about uh, the different corners of that triangle uh, correlating to primary conservation strategies. Uh, one being education. We really believe in, in shaping values, building eco-literacy. Uh, and uh, we have a very large camp program. Last year we had over 11,000 day campers, which is a big, big number across the state. And we also have an overnight uh, camp program that's been in existence for 60 plus years, the Wildwood program. Uh, the uh, Beyond Education, our advocacy department is very busy on Beacon Hill, uh, looking at legislation and advocating on behalf of the environment every day. And then the third corner of that triangle, conservation. And that's the part of it that both Jeff and I are involved with. So that's a little bit on, on who Mass Audubon is. It's a, uh, a Massachusetts-centric organization. It's not part of a national uh, organization and, um, and also happens to be the largest <coughs> private landowner in Massachusetts. A lot of people don't know that. So um, we, we, don't, we don't brag about that as much as maybe we could, uh, but uh, there's a lot of beautiful sanctuary lands across the state. So with that, I want to introduce our speaker. Uh, Jeff Ritterson is, as I said, he's a field ornithologist. Uh, Mass Audubon began as a uh, bird advocacy organization. We still have a core competency in that area, and we're very proud of that. Uh, Jeff has done some very innovative work uh, with making some uh, strategic alliances with um, key landowners and representatives of those landowners. The program that he pioneered, uh, Foresters for the Birds, is really a very important uh, program. Foresters across the state are connected with some of the most important private landowners that exist all across Massachusetts. And so it's a very, very smart idea 
uh, to connect with that group of, of stakeholders as a way of reaching and influencing those important landowners. With that, I think I'll turn it over. I get to have lunch with Jeff every now and then. We actually see each other every now and then. And uh, so please, and Jeff is also a resident of Stowe. I'm very pleased to say that. He moved to Stowe within the last year. Two-ish. Two-ish, okay, all right. It's, it's always longer than I think. And he is, uh, he, he's going to be a uh, first time dad this June. So please welcome Jeff Ritterson. You're making me blush here. <laughs> Thanks for the intro, Bob. Thanks, everyone, for uh, coming out on what seems like the really first muggy day of the year. Um, so I'll definitely be talking about some forest bird habitat, and eventually I'll introduce the Foresters for the Birds program. Um, so I thought for this talk I'd, I'd also zoom out quite a bit and discuss how managing for birds in general can help us to accomplish um, a bunch of other of our, of our forest goals, conservation goals. And I'll start with a bit of background information. The climate and the soils in Massachusetts, they're really great at growing forests. Um, throughout most of the state, if land isn't developed or maintained in some form of agriculture, the cover type, at least over time, will be, will be forest. Uh, about 60% of the state is forested, which puts us at the eighth most forested state in the nation. Uh, we're also the third most densely populated. So there's a lot of people living within and among our forests. These forests provide us with a wide range of ecosystem goods and services is kind of the buzz term, um, nature's benefits. They provide us with water quality and quantity, uh, air quality, Flood and erosion control, of course, wildlife habitat, carbon sequestration, which has bearings on, on our fight against climate change. Uh, public health benefits, recreation, jobs, tourism, forest products like, like lumber and maple syrup. To put that in the economic terms, a trust for public land estimates that annually we get $3.8 billion a year in these free services. And for every dollar invested, in land conservation, you'll see a $4 return on that investment. However, these, these ecosystem goods and services are facing a bunch of challenges currently moving into the future. Um, parts of our state have high rates of forest development, loss, forest loss and conversion to non-forest use, fragmentation. Um, invasive plants are displacing native species, disrupting ecosystem processes. Uh, parts of the state have really high density deer populations, which can really affect negatively our, our forest understory in particular. Um, invasive insects and the disease, climate change, of course. Um, and these stressors don't really act alone, but can in fact interact um, to overall worsen the, the combined effect. So for example, deer tend to browse preferentially on native plant species. Uh, which could allow the invasive species a better opportunity to gain a foothold. Or climate change is projected to increase drought conditions, which can stress our trees, making them even more susceptible to some of these uh, diseases and insects. However, there are some really key concepts put forth by the conservation community to help our forests and our, our society overcome many of these stressors, the first of which is to keep forest as forest. It sounds obvious, but you lose your forest, you lose all those great ecosystem services and benefits, uh, which is why it's super important to support your local regional land trusts. Another concept would be to reduce as many of those stressors as possible. Uh, that might mean controlling invasive plants, uh, managing your local deer herd, you can do that in large pieces of wood or in your, in your yard. I know I have some burning bush that needs to come down, some wind euonymus. That, it's not going to last another week or two or three. <clears throat> uh, and the other concept would be to in increase the overall resiliency of our, of our ecosystems. A resilient ecosystem is one that's able to 
withstand or absorb some sort of impact or stressor and maybe undergo some degree of change but ultimately return back to relatively normal conditions um, in a relatively short amount of time. One concept around that is sort of having a, a diversity of tree species, tree ages and sizes uh, all across the landscape. It's sort of like putting your eggs in multiple baskets. Or if you know a certain tree species is going to do well with future conditions, considering climate change, you might put some more of your eggs in that basket while still diversifying overall to make it more responsive to be able to adjust to stressors like climate change. <clears throat> How we really can achieve some of these conservation techniques in part has a lot to do with our future and current land use choices. Uh, the folks at Harvard Forest and their collaborators quite recently, probably within the past two years, put out the most recent edition of their Wildlands and Woodlands report. Uh, and, and they describe also the role of farmlands and communities in their vision of what a sustainable future looks like for New England. And they do assume uh, some changes in behavior like reduced consumption rates, uh, some shifts in diet to maybe more plant-based diet. <clears throat> and they outline uh, or outline their vision of what land or amount of land could be dedicated to things like farming, development, and forest. And they have a goal of really protecting 70% of New England as forest. Currently, we are here at about 22, 25%. In order to meet that goal of 70% by the year 2060, as they point out, we're going to have to triple our rate of land protection. <laughs> uh, within that forested area, they recommend having about 7% of the total or 10% of our forest in uh, what they term wildlands. This is mostly a hands-off approach where our forests are allowed to mature and natural ecosystem processes kind of shape the forest and landscape over time. These hands-off reserves are certainly important in many different ways, um, but they also have some shortfalls. For example, they don't always um, address the needs of the local human populations, and they're not going to cover enough area to really scale up our conservation needs to a meaningful level. <clears throat> And so they also recommend having about 90% of our forest, 63% of the total land area, uh, in what's termed woodlands, which these are forests, well-managed forests of various ages and with different mix of tree species um, that are managed to provide, again, a wide range of, of goods and benefits like wildlife habitat, uh, forest products. And Part of my premise of this talk is that management of birds can kind of help us to achieve these broader goals. Jeff, before you go on, can you just point still out on that map? Oh, geez. <laughs> um, so there's Cape Cod. So we're probably, uh, I don't know, light green or into the light purple area. So why birds? Uh, in Mass Autumn, we like to talk about how we use birds as an umbrella species or an indicator species. Birds are relatively conspicuous, they're easy to observe uh, and monitor. They use a wide range of habitat conditions, even within a forest, and they're well studied, so we generally know how they respond to changes in the environment. And generally what's good for them is good for a bunch of other wildlife species and, and ecosystems. So back to the forest. Um, after any sort of disturbance to the forest canopy, whether it's a natural disturbance or a bit of foreshadowing, uh, man or human caused disturbance, the forest will begin to regenerate, starting as grasses and forbs, maybe moving to wildflowers, uh, to shrubs and saplings before it matures into a forest that is, well, considered a forest traditionally defined by many people. <clears throat> Over this time, you're seeing an increase in canopy height, how tall the forest is, an increase in canopy cover, how closed in it is. You see a decreased amount of sunlight reaching the forest floor. And at least initially, um, an increase in the density of shrubs and saplings down low. 
until that forest begins to grow up and sort of shade out the plants in the understory. At which point, oftentimes, you need to know the disturbance to the canopy to get that regeneration going again. All these things, are, of course, are, of course, interrelated uh, and help to determine which birds are using the forest and often um, for what amount of time. So these birds are difficult to really pigeonhole into a certain group, but for the sake of simplicity, we can say there's birds that breed within young forest or other early successional habitats, as it's termed, and birds that breed within our older, more mature closed canopy forests. So I'll talk um, a bit first about the young forest birds. Um, as examples, I have white-throated sparrow and the chestnut-sided warbler there. And I'll point out here that this is an ephemeral habitat type. That is, it's short-lived. After about 15, maybe 20 years of regeneration, uh, it's matured past the point that is really usable to these birds. As a group, this is, they're really a group of conservation concern. Sharp decline. Um, one study pointed out about 41 species in New England of young forest birds about three quarters of which are, are considered in decline or in need of conservation attention. And this is largely due to habitat quantity. Uh, Massachusetts has lost over 90% of its habitat type since, looks like 1950. So we are the triangle, if you can find it. They're all generally the same trend seen throughout the states except for in Maine. And that's largely due, due, due to these big production forests that are managed quite intensively for, for, I believe, pulp, for paper, uh, and cut down regularly, thus creating that habitat type as they begin to regenerate. And that's kind of what it looks like. Again, a high density of, of stems down low, relatively open conditions, under 30% canopy closure, I like to say. <clears throat> this is a habitat type that is really dependent, again, on the disturbance to the canopy. Historic sources of disturbance include beavers, beaver activity, not just chewing down trees, but building that dam, flooding out an area that's killing the trees. And then once they abandon that dam, as, as beavers are, are wont to do, um, it begins to regenerate into what's called a beaver meadow, providing this habitat type. Fire was historically important, particularly um, in your pitch pine oak dominated ecosystems in the southeast of the state, I think Cape Cod. <clears throat> Uh, and storm damage, storms coming in, blowing over trees. Nowadays, of course, we're suppressing beaver activity. Uh, we've had decades of Smokey the Bear campaign. And our more middle-aged forests tend to be less susceptible to storm damage. So current sources of this habitat type include um, power line rights-of-ways, rights-of-way, um, that are specifically managed in a, in a shrubby condition. Um, this habitat exists on some of our state wildlife management areas. Um, Mass Audubon also is creating some on, on a few of our sanctuaries. And logging has historically, forestry activities has historically been important. Um, but society has kind of shied away from the more intense forestry operations that are needed to really create this habitat type. There's an overall goal of having about 10% of our existing forest in a young forest condition to sort of restore that balance of age classes on the landscape. <clears throat> um, you don't need to study all these different forestry practices, but generally they're considered even age management. We have a single age of trees that result in these, after these practices. So here, um, this is a 20 acre habitat cut in Peru, Massachusetts, way far out west. Um, that's maybe less than a year since the treatment happened. And it's like, whoa, that's quite drastic. It's kind of jarring at first. Um, I found it to be beautiful. And this just loaded with singing white-throated sparrows. And they left behind like a nice slash pile for birds to hide in. It's different microclimate in there. Um, just really full of white-throated sparrows. This is a cut in Lemonster, 10 acre cut. About, I would say, three or four years old, uh, full of prairie warblers. Another one of these young forest birds. Uh, and this is a cut, I don't know how big, taken somewhere in Massachusetts. Um, 
but again, a bit older, you can see it's growing up and growing up and to the point where it begins to mature even further and begin to accommodate some of these mature forest bird species. Um, let's see, what do I have here? Viri, black-throated blue warbler, wood thrush, and black-throated green warbler. Um, as a group, they're faring better than our young forest birds. There are some species like wood thrush, like scarlet tanger, that are in sharp decline over the past few decades. <clears throat> Others remain relatively common, but we like to keep them that way um, and keep their populations robust in the face of, of these forest stressors like climate change. One way to do that is to ensure that they have really high quality habitat. <clears throat> when we talk about high quality forest bird habitat, we're all often talking about having a complex vertical structure. So we like to see um, some leaf litter, other organic material on the forest floor, or birds like the oven variable nest. Um, areas of a developed mid-story, say zero to five feet, where black-throated blue warbler will nest, at about knee height usually. Um, some developed mid-story, five to 30 feet high, where birds like wood thrush nest. All under a relatively closed canopy, where up high scarlet tanager and other species will nest. <clears throat> Other features of high quality habitat include um, snags, dead standing trees that are decomposing, um, cavity trees, which are often found in snags, which are providing nesting habitat for woodpeckers, uh, titmice, chickadees, a range of other birds, um, downed coarse woody debris on the ground, which again is decomposing, uh, providing that complexity that we're looking for. Um, Roth grouse in particular will jump up there and do their, do their display. Uh, and gaps in the canopy, again, letting that sunlight down to the forest floor, getting that understory regenerating. All these are features really common in, in old growth forests, of which we have very few. Uh, instead, our more middle-aged woods are, are kind of really homogenous and structurally not that complex. Largely, you know, this is simplifying it, but our, our, most of our forests were completely cleared for agricultural purposes subsequently abandoned, so our forest kind of started growing up at the same time, so all the trees are more or less the same age, with different forest processes and tree species compositions resulting. However, forestry can be used to really mimic some of these old growth features and help to really improve the bird habitat. <clears throat> so, techniques for doing this would be considered uneven age management, where again, you might come in and thin out some of the trees, or do a little bit of a, you know, select five or six trees, do some group cuts, again, creating that gap in the canopy to get regeneration going. And during this time, you can alter the tree species composition, maybe select some, there are some trees that are predicted to do well with climate change, for example. <clears throat> so that was kind of a long-winded way to introduce the Foresters for the Birds program. Um, but with all this in mind, Mass Audubon partnered with the state's Department of Conservation and Recreation to start the Foresters for the Birds program in Massachusetts. And the concept is that we, we train the private consulting foresters, the folks that Bob mentioned that are really working one-on-one -on -one with, the, with the landowners, um, to assess the current habitat conditions on a property and then make any sort of recommendations for improvement through a, through a forest management plan. We then connect those forests with private landowners, uh, or in some instances with land trusts and, and municipalities, town forests, um, to really empower them to manage for, for bird habitat and help them to meet their goals. Getting some of this work done on private land is certainly important, as some 65, about 70 percent of our forests are in non-industrial private ownership. Good news is people like birds. Um, one of our nation's favorite pastimes is bird watching in one form or another. Um, virtually every culture around the world, world identifies with birds and has for, for thousands of years, I would imagine. Um, so people really respond to birds and to wildlife in general. If you look at the National Woodland Owner Survey, some of those, these data that were, um, that's conducted by the Forest Service, You'll see in Massachusetts that almost 70% of respondents indicated that one of the reasons they own forest land is to protect or improve wildlife habitat, where less than 20% had really any interest in, in timber production. 
same sort of thing is reflected in the thousand and the, the number of acres under these sort of goals. Meanwhile, only about 26% of landowners have some sort of plan that helps them to realize um, their, their wildlife goals or other goals they may have. <clears throat> The folks at, there's a group down at Yale who put together these, this um, website titled Tools for Engaging Landowners Effectively. They would classify many of our landowners, and you know, you may identify with this, as woodland retreat owners, and define those folks as having a really high stewardship ethic. They love the wildlife, the birds, they like the beauty, and they really enjoy spending time in the woods with their friends and family. Um, but they also have these barriers to management action, which are sometimes a lack of, of technical know-how on how to accomplish their goals, and a fear of taking action that, that will cause damage. So the Forces for the Birds program really addresses the first two by, again, providing the, the landowner with a professional. It's really good. We kind of call Foresters like the architect in the woods that's able to design how, how they'd like the woods to look and what tree species, and they're quite good at, at accomplishing those goals. Oh, and there's also financial constraints, and a forester can help you work through some of that as well. <clears throat> but these, you know, management does, in fact, cost money. Um, there are programs, for example, Natural Resource Conservation Service, a federal entity um, funded through the Farm Bill, can provide cost share funding to help landowners accomplish some of these practices. Um, Mass Wildlife has a, has a grant program for habitat management. But these can be tough to navigate, quite complicated for the average landowner to really get through. Foresters can often get you through NRCS. Um, but another way to, to fund management is through timber revenue. Um, in some instances, it's possible, but not always, because um, Massachusetts, the forest industry, has really been struggling. <clears throat> Uh, the, the graph on the left there shows that the amount of sawmills has really declined in Massachusetts, local sawmills since the 1980s. Same sort of trend shown in the volume of, of local timber produced. Most of our timber goes up to northern New England or Quebec for processing. And this sort of model of export um, really doesn't create many jobs. It creates a job for the forest or maybe the logging crew. Um, whereas if you're able to produce and sell timber locally, it can create more jobs, strengthen your world economy, and really increase the value of keeping the forest as forest for, for private landowners and let them more successfully resist development pressures. <clears throat> However, in Massachusetts, we, we consume a lot of wood. Um, the illusion of preservation was uh, introduced to me, at least... Uh, in, a, in a 2002 paper from the folks at Harvard Forest. And then they point out that Massachusetts is comparable to Germany, Switzerland, Japan, and France in terms of the percent forest, forest cover and the population density of, of humans. And the gray bar will show that we consume way more wood per capita than these other areas. Um, meanwhile, the, other, the white bar shows how much wood we produce locally. So in Massachusetts, we have really, really good environmental oversight of our, of our forest harvesting and best management practices put in place. But meanwhile, we're importing our wood from areas that are usually more ecologically sensitive um, and or with, with poor environmental regulations put in place. So I realize it might sound like a tycoon up here telling that, that you should go out and exploit our natural resources for every dollar that they're worth. Um, that's not what I'm saying, but instead I'm advocating to at least start thinking about um, the sustainable use of some of our natural resources, to take responsibility for our own sustainability, to sort of think globally but act locally, and to kind of avoid living an illusion of preservation. Uh, many of you probably know Aldo Leopold. Um, one of the conservation pioneers in our nation uh, who did a lot of great writing and a lot of this philosophy still underpins our, our current thinking around conservation. 
And he wrote in a Sand County Almanac, one of his celebrated works, that there are two spiritual dangers in not owning a farm. One is supposing that breakfast comes from the grocery, the other that heat comes from the furnace. Um, I'm not saying we should all own a farm or be heating our, wood, our homes with wood, but I think we've done a relatively good job of embracing sort of the locally grown food movement, the first part of this statement, but either don't know about or have largely ignored or rejected the same social, ecological, and economic benefits of, of local wood. So just to kind of sum it all up, um, having locally produced wood, wood markets can help to fund wildlife habitat projects. Uh, it can help in the fight against global warming and the fact that we're not shipping our wood all over the world. Um, we can sometimes build with wood that can replace more carbon intensive resources like car, uh, the concrete and steel. Um, it can help to make our forest more resilient to climate change. Strong markets can help to strengthen our world economies, again, helping landowners to resist development pressures, which hopefully can, really, can lead to more protected areas. And oftentimes forestry activity can help to create recreational opportunities. For example, logging trails often end up being cross-country trails or hiking trails. Hiking trails can lead to more interest in birds, to more protected, so on and so forth. It's all interrelated. Um, and my point is, I think I can, I'm working on maybe putting birds at the top of this and kind of driving all these different activities um, through birds. Thank you very much. That's all I have for you. Um, maybe we can take a question or two, then we're going to bring up, I think, uh, Carol to talk about some Stowe Conservation Trust activities. Yes, ma'am. How many years does it take for a forest to come back after the fire is out in California? So to what um, to what stage of forest is my question back to you? And I don't I can't really speak to California forests, but I guess they would begin to regenerate at least locally to that young forest condition within a year or two to really provide habitat for these birds, and then to become to really have these old growth conditions that I talked about. It takes some two or three hundred years of of forest succession. Most of our forests are around eighty to 120 years old, so they're not currently providing that high quality habitat in many instances. Yes, sir. You didn't mention uh, the world, I mean, you mentioned the passing deer, but I mean, I know from some of the forests that we walked through, the understory is almost missing because it's been browsed by deer. Mm hmm. Massachusetts think that that's something that we need to work on differently than we're working on today? Yeah, indeed. Um, so Mass Wildlife is in charge of managing our deer populations, and they kind of have the state divided into zones, uh, management zones. And many of them outside of 495 um, are within their targets of having, don't quote me on this, but somewhere between 10 and 20 deer per square mile. But inside of 495 in areas, I think, like on the Nantucket and maybe in the southeast of the state, um, really have high densities of deer. You hear stories of like 80 to 100 deer per square mile, uh, which again affects the understory. I think the state would love to, to get a handle on that. A lot of it comes down to hunter access. Um, there's discharge setbacks from homes. You can't be within, I think, 500 feet of a home and hunt. A lot of that has to do with town bylaws, so towns can amend those or consider archery, which is often a safer form of hunting. You can get in a tree stand short, shoot your arrow downwards. Um, so it is a concern, for sure, and one that Mass Audubon is, is addressing as well. Jeff, if I could yeah. jump in on that one. So uh, I'm glad you raised the question. Um, it's counterintuitive for many people that it may be necessary to reduce the number of species like deer mm. in order to maintain biodiversity within the forest. There are plants, forest uh, uh, ground cover plants that should still be here in Stowe that are that are already gone. And um, and if they're over browsed for a number of consecutive years, the seed bank is gone. And that's when that species mm. leaves the scene altogether. And with that there's a, a cascade effect on, on other 
species, plants and animals. So many land trusts in Massachusetts, in addition to Mass Audubon mm -hmm. and state wildlife, are very concerned about this. Um, the Stowe Conservation Trust is debating that now, uh, and we'll be studying that closely, looking at the experiences of a lot of uh, local land trusts to take appropriate steps to reduce deer density somewhat to preserve overall forest by reversing. Yes, ma'am. Can you talk a little bit about prescribed burns? Sudbury Valley Trustees just had a great project a few years ago in Sudbury in the Memorial Forest. Right. Restoring pitch pine habitat and the birds and certain moth species and other habitat have flooded back. Right. I I didn't. I've been to that memorial forest, and it looks like a great project. Um, it's a, a little bit out of my area of expertise. I recently visited Crane Wildlife Man. No, Miles Standish Wildlife Management, where DCR is beginning to implement all these practices. Um, a lot of the plants associated with that ecosystem type uh, are fire adapted and need fire to begin to regenerate. Um, and historically, the fire occurred more frequently and sort of kept that fire load from, from building up too much and having really intense fires that then um, kill the canopy trees as well. So it's, it's about, I guess, having more frequent, less intense fires that help to sort of restore the natural conditions um, in these sort of pine barrens and have that flush of undergrowth, which provide great habitat for like bobwhite quail and other, uh, other young forest birds. Does that answer sort of your question? <laughs> a little bit on one of the islands. What's the sanctuary name? Sikachacha? Uh, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so we do have some of that, some of that habitat type and work to employ prescribed burns. Yeah. You know? Yes, Carol. To what extent after you um, selectively log, then do people manage what grows back afterwards? Yeah, good question. Um, I mean, management plans are written in 10-year in chunks. So the forester often comes back every 10 years to reassess what's there and to prescribe new forestry practices to help to meet the landowner's goals. Um, so if there are timber goals in mind, you might come in and do another little thinning or harvest some trees to sort of get that perpetual growth of of trees over time of different ages. Um, I'm not a forester, <laughs> so that might be a better question for, for a forester that could answer more clearly. Yes, sir. You spoke of a 2060 objective of forestation of New England. That sounds counterintuitive when you see all the development that continues. So are we going to have farms closing down? Or how are we going to do that? Good question. So in that, in that graph, they kind of had also, a, in their vision, they had an area dedicated to farmlands as well. And it assumes that we're growing things that we're good at growing and doing some trading. And assumes that we're shifting our diets to, to more plant-based so we can produce more, more food on the landscape. Um, Bob can probably speak more clearly to this, but we do need to pick up our pace of conservation, of, of protection of land. I think Massachusetts is about 25% protected and 25% developed. So there's this 50% of forest remaining. That's kind of a race to to save, essentially. Do you have any comments on you that? You might talk about the, the 1830 uh, picture of mm -hmm. the fort, how much was forest, how much was clear, yeah. and, and how much has changed the current day might put it in perspective. There's, there's, there's a bigger opportunity to, to preserve forest currently than you might realize. There's more forest yeah. <laughs> than there was, essentially. Yeah. yeah. So 1830, there was about 10% of the state was forest, and 90% was open land. And that's why you could see forever from any high hill. And now it's 70% forest, 65? Yep, 60-ish, 65, yeah. So maybe at this point, I can turn it over to Carol to talk a little bit about a project that's still conservation trust is considering. Uh, 
Uh, you can just hold it. Or, okay. You know. <laughs> Thanks. So um, the Stowe Conservation Trust decided several years ago that we should identify uh, or we should have a forest stewardship plan for all of our properties. And in that, we weren't really looking at necessarily making the most out of the timber harvest. Um, we decided to look at all kinds of other components that might benefit as well. So whether it was um, climate resilience, as, as Jeff has mentioned, or whether it was invasive control, plant invasive controls, or if it was wildlife habitat and biodiversity. And that seemed to be sort of really some of the big stuff that we were interested in. And so for each of our properties, we had a forest stewardship plan done. And we've been, we've done some things that came out of those plans already. Um, and one of the directors who wasn't able to be here today had put together a proposal to us for the um, Fieldstone property, which is up off of Taylor Road. And that property is about 53 acres, and there's a trail that goes in kind of um, behind some homes. Um, and let's see, I'm not sure where the first slide is. To get to that, it's just hit the right. Bar. Hit the space bar. So um, we had, as I said, we had the plan done, and then this is on John Sangramano, who some of you might know. He met with a forester from the, from the New England Forestry Consultants who had helped write the plan kind of walk through what some of the things he was thinking of doing. And we decided really we wanted to kind of do something small scale um, to really be a demonstration project that we didn't want to necessarily go in with a forest cutting project until we kind of was trying to introduce it. So this part of this program today was introducing some of the concepts and why we might be doing management and, and not hugging every tree, I guess. <laughs> so, um, Let's see, so there's about a half an acre within the Fieldstone property that um, we're going to work on. And John just retired this uh, couple of months, uh, like a few weeks ago, and so he's introducing it this spring. And I should say it's, um, it's part of, there's a stewardship committee that we have. So the, the, the trust, the directors have kind of broken into some specialties. One's a stewardship committee. There's also a person who's kind of helping to lead up the Stu Crew project. Some of you may be on our Stu Crew <laughs> or help out with that. And, um, you know, we depend on you as well as the, the board of directors to kind of get projects underway. So the area that he's showing on this is there's a loop trail. And so if you come in, I don't have a, a way to sort of arrow it, but you can see that, that um, work area in the yellow. And... Um, let me see, I think he's, we've got some photos. It's very, very dense. There's, um, there's just a lot of trees that are dying because of the density. Uh, the lower picture you can see, there's this very little crown on the top of any of the trees. And the idea that we have is, and again, based on some of what Jeff has said and some of what um, the foresters have said, is to look to do some thinning. So hand work is going to be done looking at we're selectively going to try to protect some um, larger trees and different species of trees that we i think they're well we've been calling them legacy trees but there's some other terms for that as well um, the idea is to have those trees become bigger and stronger um, getting more sunlight to the ground as jeff was saying getting more um, complexity on the ground and having maybe some different um, um, growth come in, so whether it's the ground cover, which there's virtually none, and shrubs and, and small saplings hopefully starting to come in. And then also trying to follow the, the best management practices for the habitat purposes of having large piles of the debris. Um, I forget, is it like a meter that, or there's a size that you kind of like to have? Oh, for the slash. For the slash, yeah. yeah. Um, Meter by meter, meter cubed, or yeah. Meter so the idea is that right now the ground is fairly well littered, but it's pretty spread out, and that we will create some piles, you know, that can be good for the birds to um, hopefully either for food or nesting. And this is just another photo from this winter, looking at maybe some of the bigger trees. It's a hardwood forest with oak and pine mix primarily. Um, the other part is also the invasive plant work. Um, John's been doing some of that all along, but 
we've identified and we need to continue to sort of map out where the invasive plants are so that we can monitor them and make sure that our goals of sort of reducing those populations are coming through. When we do do the cutting and opening up the, the trees and the canopy a little bit, we also want to make sure that, you know, those invasives aren't coming into those spots, with, which they're apt to do. So we have sort of similar to your backyards and field edges, a lot of the same plants in there. He's got Japanese knotweed, oriental bittersweet, multiflora rose, burning bush, which you mentioned, um, barberry, and buckthorn, which are very typical everywhere. So when we do this, the goal is to observe what happens. You know, what's the speed of things breaking down? Um, are we, again, taking advantage, you know, making sure the invasives aren't getting in, looking at new ground cover, hopefully, hopefully, and anybody who is interested in birds and mammals, you know, can help by going out there and monitoring and telling us what they're seeing and keeping some, some track of that. Are we seeing some of the species that are going in decline and, you know, doing a good job of that? Are we introducing front-headed cupboards or other things that we don't necessarily want, you know, to come in. So it does need monitoring and, um, you know, and so again, we're just looking to make this an example. It's one, of the, one project and hopefully um, we'll be able to build on that and um, do some other forestry management projects in the future. So I'm happy to see if I can answer any questions if you have any, but we mostly want to introduce that. Yes, uh, would this be a good time to do some deer hunting in that property to monitor what the results have? It's possible. I deer, that'd be in the fall because that's when it's allowed. Um, I think we might have to wait and see to where we get with the, you know we're trying to balance a lot of uses, right? So we have people who are hiking the trails, which is why we've kind of selected the area that we are that's a little further in, and it's it's also we don't want to be having the trees come down on the trails and which we've talked about, um, we would probably do archery, but we've also tried to balance whether having it done professionally is the better way to do it or whether to open it up. Um, so th everything needs to be considered, I guess I would say. But another thing that we've talked about too are some exclosure areas, like they do have areas that you can kind of build um, to keep deer from coming in to browse it so that you can kind of monitor what's happening and that's another thing we might do first. We might try to see what our population is like because I don't know if we know what the population is in that area. Yeah. Well, it's high everywhere but and, and there is evidence of it whenever you walk through that but learning to look for those, you know, the things that are nipped and, you know, is something that we probably all need better training at. So when you do an enclosure in Europe, you're to me, it sounds like you're going to fence it out and see what grows in that area. It doesn't grow with the deer have more ready access. Right. Yeah. 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 And Janice involved with one in Westford, in Weston, that she's done with her high school students. Yeah, it's a long-term project, so, you know. Yeah. Are you looking to have the studio do some of the invasive removal? I think we'd like to have both the invasive removal as well as the um, the cutting. Some of the wood is really just like very, I don't know the term if it's log poles or it's saw poles or pole pole timber. You know, it's little. You know, so some of it can be done with hand saws. Um, you know, without having to have chainsaw activity. The other question I had was um, I saw someone doing this kind of thinning. I thought at Captain Sergeant towards the front. I know if they, yeah, that's the town okay. piece. So like doing yeah, I'm not aware of it. So that'd be interesting. We can check with um, the conservation yeah. administrator there. Yep. Excuse me. Somebody made the comment earlier about cycling wood locally, and um, we have a still have a sawmill in Stowe, or mm -hmm. probably on the Hudson side, over oh, by that that the landfill off Hudson Road. And I think they're still open, the sign's still up. And um, I'm not sure who buys the wood from there. Um, I did. Somebody's one. And I so. Think he's died. Pardon? I think he died. Well, he had an accident, but somebody else took it over, I think. Okay, the sign was active there. So if, uh, if that's the case, maybe the trust could be instrumental in coordinating uh, a mill to process wood off of trust land and sell it wholesale to um, lumber stores like National Lumber and Sunbury 
the Duarcan is still open, with the idea that this natural material that is being processed on trust land is being recycled and reused locally. Yeah, that's a great idea. I don't know enough about that that sawmill or even what our production could be. I mean, some of it can come down to getting the harvest done to get it to the amount that would make it workable and feasible. But I love all the local <laughs> ideas yeah, there. Yeah. Rather than pay somebody to cut good hardwood down and take it away, we need to do a way where that wood can be put into, the, into a, an economic stream so that somebody will gladly do the cutting for the trusts uh, so it can be uh, milled into uh, marketable uh, boards. Okay. The, the other point I had is I used to work closely with the Conservation uh, Commission in uh, our town forest, which is uh, town and, and the problem there, I think we did uh, thin maybe two or three years. It's the number of Dick Perkins I haven't seen him here, but he, we had a uh, forester come in and mark trees. Um, the problem is that forest was maintained for softwood many decades from 100 years. And so the marketable wood was hardwood, not softwood. So come in and get somebody to thin out some softwood, you have to pay them, and then the softwood would just lay on the ground probably a lot because it's not a lot of market for white pine. Yeah, so one, one of the things that potentially could happen too is looking at different properties at the same time. So if there is a decision to um, do some timber harvesting on another property in town, you know, they may be able to come in and do something where, say, say and I'm not going to say that they want, anybody wants to do Captain Sergeant because I don't know if the town does, but if they did and say that had more hardwood and they were able to make their profit there, they might be able to go into the town forest and do some of the other softwoods. So, yeah. you know, it is, it's, it's, a part of this is just opening the conversation so that we can start to learn about some of the ideas or what some of the needs might be. One yeah. of the other things that used to occur with the Conservation Commission was marking trees for residents to do a kind of four program mm -hmm. a year. Yeah. And the trees would be marked at the town forest and then there would be a certain day or days where people could come in and cut their cord of wood. Yeah. I think everybody loved that idea, and I don't know how um, people today feel about it because of liability. <coughs> I think that's the biggest Not issue. We all, you know, we've, it's come up a number of times that people remember doing it, and it was kind of a, you know, fun camaraderie kind of thing. And you got wood, and you did it locally, but. It's, um, I'm not sure that it's something as easy to put together. So. I have the remains of the Stevenson sawmill. If anybody would like to put it all back together. With me. <laughs> <laughs> well, I have a young forester in my family. I will mention that. <laughs> well, if you don't have questions, we do have um, some treats. We'd love you to mingle for a little bit. And thank you for coming out. And as you... If you have an interest, certainly either through the, the Stowe Conservation Trust website or through our Facebook page, you could, you know, just let us know that you would like to either be part of the stew crew or that you are walking and you'd like to do some monitoring or, you know, anything that you're interested in helping with is always welcome. So thank you very much. Thank you.